Last Sunday, uh, my wife and I and Dennis, we had just gotten back from Zambia. How many were here last week when we shared some of the stories? Had an awesome outreach. We also had Thomas and Hannah with us. They weren't here last Sunday, but they were part of the team. They led a team going out daily into the schools, schools and jails, preaching the gospel. So just an awesome young couple who are full-time missionaries with Youth of the Mission. So if you haven't already got to know these guys, they're gold. Get to know them. Um, But I want to start off today, and what I have on my heart to share, I'm titling it, God, Your Healer. How many guys think that sounds like a good name? And uh, this might end up being a part one and a part two, just because I have so many things I want to cover today. But I'm going to start out by sharing a few healing stories from our last trip to Africa. Uh, Last week, we shared kind of a broad view about what God is doing over there with our our ministry based in Nakondi, northern Zambia, Uh, the crusades we did, everything that God did in these communities uh, in the remote northern part of the nation. But I want to kind of bring it down into a few of the, and this is really just a couple of the healing stories that God did in people's lives up there. And then from there, we'll go into talking about actual physical healing. And uh, I want to lay some things out, real basic things, things that hopefully we all know, but the truth is, is that sometimes things that we believe are established in our hearts, we, we begin to realize that they're just really not established, and uh, the, the truth of God's word. And I remember in about 1999, 2000, I'd been in ministry for a couple years, and we traveled around, seen God do incredible things, and I always believed in healing. Uh, I, I never, I didn't grow up in a church that taught that the gifts of the Holy Spirit or healing stopped with the early apostles. Um, I grew up, my mom would bring me, I grew up in a divided family, but my mom would bring me to uh, Pentecostal charismatic churches. And so we would see people healed from time to time, but it was still very, very mystical. It was kind of hit and miss. And you guys know what I'm talking about. And it was one of those things I saw it a little bit more of, uh, well, if God decides to heal this person, he's going to heal this person. But I didn't have a real biblical foundation for healing, physical healing, and why we can expect it every time. And so I remember back then, what's going on here? All good. (laughs) Uh, I remember back in about 2000, I began to steady it for myself because I've always been one of those guys that I'm not just going to take your word for something. And I'm not just going to take a pastor's word, even if he's a great pastor or preacher. You don't take anyone's word for it. You take the word for it, right? And you steady it out for yourself. And so I remember I went through every single verse in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And some of the things I was looking for, I didn't need to ask God, is healing for today? Because I already knew that God doesn't change. But some of the things that I began to look for was, is it God's will to heal every time? Um, Is it God's will to heal immediately? Was healing included in what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, or is this just something that God does, does on a whim? And I remember as after several months of going through, I read a couple books, but I also went through every verse that I could find in the Bible, I came to some serious conclusions that, yes, it is God's will to heal every time. Yes, The blood of Jesus not only forgives our sins, but heals our diseases. I came to certain convictions, and after that, I began to see more healings. Now, it wasn't until I really grasped the message of God's grace and love, where I realized that I was completely qualified to walk in these things, that I really began to see more of release in them. But it started a journey of really looking into what the Scripture said. So I'm going to try to do a little bit of teaching, a little less preaching today, and then hopefully bring some things, because I know there's folks here that that are going th- through things physically. That's just that's part of living in this world, right? It doesn't have to be that way, but there are things that we go through in life. And so whether you're trying to walk out a healing for yourself or um, help someone else receive healing, uh, my prayer today is that things I share, would the lights would go on. Now, Jason and I were talking out in the parking lot today, and it's like you can hear something a thousand times, but there, there's a point sometimes where the lights go on and it becomes revelation for you. And I remember back in our, our old church building, there was a lady that she was listening to me preach one of the Sundays, and she said, it was like when you said this, the lights went on and immediately I was healed just sitting out in the congregation. And it wasn't anything I did. It was just her heart grasped the truth that had always been there. Amen? So let's start, Gabriel, by showing a couple of these pictures and just some of the 
amazing stories that God did in Africa. This right here, that was one of our altar calls that was on the first night of the crusade in Impalungal. And uh, overall, we had about 25,000 people come out to the events, hear the gospel, and we recorded about 15,000 people, uh, men and women, children, that gave their lives to Jesus Christ during those 10 days of outreach. But that was one of the altar calls. Go ahead to the next one. Um, this was in Mbala. This was the first crusade we did. And this was the final night. And on the final night of these, we call them crusades. I don't really like that word, but, uh, but that's what they still call them over there, these big evangelistic rallies. And on the last night, my wife, Hoochie, and I always tag team preach. We preach together. And right before we went up on the stage to preach the gospel, the ushers brought in this boy or this man on a mat and just put him right in front of the stage, like about two feet out from the stage, just laid him there. And um, yeah, I'm thinking, is this guy even alive? He wasn't moving. They just put him down there. And so we're like, uh, you know, we're just going to do what we do. We're going to preach the gospel. The gospel can raise the dead, right? And as we're preaching, as we're going about five minutes into it, this guy just sits up and then tries to jump up and falls back down. And we're thinking, wow, praise God, something's happening. Ten minutes later, he literally just stands up and walks off, off the side, just out into the darkness. And about 15 minutes later, um, after the altar call, they bring him up on stage and they told us his story. That day he had been in a soccer accident or a football accident, if you're African, and, uh, and he, he had, there was some sort of an accident and he felt something snap. And shortly after that, he lost complete consciousness and was unable to move his body. And so his mom put him on a, this mat and had some friends bring him to the, the hospital. And the hospital said, we don't know what's going on. He's still completely unconscious, keep this in mind. And so they decide, we're going to bring him to this crusade event. We're going to trust God. The doctors can't do anything. What do we got to lose? We're going to trust Jesus. So they bring him. And in the middle of the program, four men just walk him in on this mat. He's still completely unconscious and unable to move, completely paralyzed. And in the middle of the preaching, he wakes up, gets completely healed, and then comes up on stage to testify. Awesome, huh? Man, we didn't even know he was there. We didn't know his situation until he told us. It was just the power of the gospel raised this kid up. Go ahead with the next one, Gabriel. That's him testifying, the kid in the yellow. That was after Jesus healed him, and he was normal. He was just dancing and singing. Even took the microphone and started singing from the stage. <laughs> Completely healed. Next one, son. Uh, this was in one of the nights in our second crusade, and the girl there in blue, uh, Pastor Dennis actually prayed for her, and she, two months before, had lost complete movement in her legs. They had gone paralyzed, and again, she had gone to the doctor, and they couldn't do anything. And when she came up on stage, she was holding her crutch in the air, and that is what she had used to walk to that crusade that night. She was completely healed, and uh, Dennis said, yeah, I, pr I prayed for her, and she just started crying and ran off after I prayed for her. And I said, yeah, didn't you see? She, she came up on stage, and she was completely healed. And not only was she healed, but she just she couldn't contain herself. She was weeping with thankful, thankfulness. And just to see that kind of gratefulness of the love and power of God was incredible. Her uncle came up, gave her a big hug, and he was the one that had been taking care of her. And just to watch the power of God. And these people, you gotta, you got to keep this in mind, not only do they get healed physically, but they encounter Jesus Christ and they get new life. That's the greatest miracle of all. But God's after the whole thing, spirit, soul, and body. Next pick. This was another really, really cool. And some of these I've posted on our Facebook page with a little more in-depth. This one, I think we have video, a uh, two-minute video of her sharing. But this young lady had been born or slightly after being born, she grew, got really sick and the doctor said she had epilepsy. Now, she was around... I'm guessing 17, 18 years old there, and she had been on medicine and uh, had epilepsy her whole life. She said that her brothers had brought her to the witch doctors. And to give you guys an idea, this is an area that is just full of witchcraft, and if the doctors can't help you, what they normally do is bring you to the witch doctor. And we'll pray for people that will have these cuts all over their chest that have, they've healed up, but there's these scars, and what it is, it's from the witch doctors doing their witchcraft and actually cutting the people. 
And so this girl had tried everything, but she heard about this crusade. And this is what's so, so cool is she heard about what we were going to do. And we always advertise, bring the sick, bring the, no, those that need a miracle. Jesus is going to heal them. And so she, before coming to that crusade, she said, Jesus is going to heal me. She stopped taking her epilepsy medicine. Faith, right? Now, I don't tell people, stop taking your medicine. I didn't even know she was, she was there, but she ended up stopping the medicine, coming, feeling in her body that she was completely made well, and then came up on stage and shared a testimony that, of what she had gone through and how Jesus had made her well and how she knew in her body that she was completely healed. That's faith right there. That is faith. But it was a beautiful testimony. And then at the end of it, she starts preaching to the crowd. She's like, if Jesus did it for me, he can do it for you. Trust in Jesus tonight. That's the best kind of evangelist right there. <laughs> I think we've got one or two more. This was in uh, the, the first crusade in the town of Imbala. This was one of the very first, this was the first night. Now on the first night, um, and, and let me tell you, spiritual warfare is a reality, even though the devil has been totally defeated. And uh, the the biggest form of spiritual warfare is when you actually go into these places and start preaching the gospel. Spiritual warfare isn't sitting in your room and tearing down principalities and powers that Jesus already dealt with. Spiritual warfare is when you go and preach the truth and people believe the truth and they are delivered. And so in this first city, it was, there was just crazy things happening the first night. Um, we had a short circuit and eight of our speakers ended up going down the first night. And even though that happened, we were still able to preach the gospel Everything got fixed for the second night. But this was the first testimony that came up. And this young man, um, actually, he wasn't a young man. He's probably in his 30s. But he ended up getting, uh, two years before, he started just losing his hearing. And by the time of that crusade, he could hear almost nothing. And he ended up coming up on stage and just testifying that God had completely healed him. And his wife was in the crowd, and she was saying, yes, this is my husband. Jesus healed him. It was just beautiful. How many of you guys know if you're blind or if you're deaf and you get your sight or hearing back, that's pretty major. Because here, the, you, they don't have any options. It's Jesus or nothing. Go ahead, Gabe. That right there in the, in the, um, in the suit, the gray suit, that's... Pastor Paul Ciccioni, he's our African director. We've been working together for 12 years. He's the guy that oversees everything that, uh, that we do in Africa. But he brought up on stage that little child who was four years old and had never been able to walk. That child was born with some sort of a sickness and uh, had never walked in his entire life. Jesus healed that little child, and that child was just walking normally across that stage. And that little lady on the microphone was the mom testifying about how Jesus healed his child. Isn't that beautiful? Was that the last one? All right. All right. Good job, Gabriel. Give it up for Gabriel. He was part of our media, our media team in Africa, and he was out there recording videos and getting pictures and doing all kinds of good stuff. It's, it's a blessing to have your kids in the ministry. Amen. Well, let's get into some of the word today. How's that sound? So, God, your healer. I'm going to talk about some basic facts from Scripture, because how many of you guys know if you, you know, you can have subjective truth, but this right here is absolute truth. And you can have some evangelist come to town. What's up, guys? You can have an evangelist come to town or someone that really flows in a gift of healing and you can get healed oftentimes. How many of you guys have seen that happen? And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, God does put gifts in the church of, of healing and working of miracles. But my question is always, well, what happened if that guy or girl's not around? What happens if there's not the gifts of the Holy Spirit flowing? What happens if you don't have a translator, <laughs> you know, and, and you can't really flow in the gifts? I believe the best way to walk out health and healing is having your own heart established in the word of God where you can receive it yourself. Does that make sense? Because that's a guarantee every time when you know the truth and when you believe the truth for yourself. Now, I'm all for gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'm all for word of wisdom and word of knowledge. But 
a lot of the times, folks that go to healing meetings receive a healing. If their heart doesn't become established in what the Word of God says for them personally, it's like those same symptoms come right back into their lives, and they just, they just take on that sickness all over again. And it's not that uh, people, people use the terminology, well, they lost it. I don't really like that um, type of terminology, but the truth is their heart wasn't established in the truth for them for themselves. They were almost writing out someone else's faith. And we've all done that, and I've seen people healed, and I still do. You know, I flow in the gifts, and we still so we see people healed. But the point of this today is I want to lay out some biblical truth of why we can believe for healing for ourselves every time. How's that sound? So what is faith? Now, faith obviously is absolutely essential to every area of our walk with God, right? Faith is an absolute necessity. So faith means confidence, steadfastness. It means to be fully persuaded. So faith must have its foundation based on God's word, okay? I'm losing my papers. Faith on God's word. How many of you guys know that the Bible is the will of God? The Bible shows us what the will of God is. Romans 10 verse 17 says, faith comes how? By hearing. Hearing by what? Hearing by the word of God. Now, we know that that's not just referring necessarily to every part of the word of God, because every part of the word of God doesn't necessarily bring faith into your life, right? You know, don't trim the edges of your beard. That doesn't bring faith into your life, does it? That was Leviticus 23.3. <laughs> but faith, when interpreted from a new covenant standpoint, it brings faith into our lives. So faith is us becoming absolutely persuaded of who God is and what he wants to do in our life. And faith is absolutely essential if we're going to walk out faith. Now, let me also say this. Don't ever try, when it comes to healing, don't ever try to have enough faith to get yourself healed, okay? That's just the wrong way to approach this. Because anytime you're looking at your faith or your ability, you're becoming conscious of yourself and not conscious of Jesus Christ. You know, there's two people in the Bible that the Bible says they had great faith. One was a Roman and one was a Greek woman. Both of these people, they were not under law, and both of these people really had no idea of faith or lack of faith, and both of these people, Jesus said, had great faith. Think about that. Two people that Jesus specifically said had great faith, as far as we can tell, they were never even thinking about their faith. So don't try to have enough faith to get healed. Focus on Jesus. Focus on the Word of God. Meditate. Read contemplate the word until faith just naturally appears in your heart. Does that make sense? That's key right there. So healing through the word, and in a lot of our crusades, um, most of the time, I don't even lay hands on people to pray. Now, there is a biblical precedent for laying hands on the sick and seeing them healed. Usually, if we have a big team, we'll turn the team loose, and they'll pray for people in the front. But what we always do, and I learned this from great evangelists of the past, like T.L. Osborne, people that really that saw incredible miracles, is you teach people the truth about Jesus being the healer, get them to a place where they actually believe the Word of God for themselves, and then help them to receive it for themselves. And so what we'll always do is we'll preach the gospel, we'll give a response to the gospel, and then we'll start sharing a little bit about healing, maybe some scripture, some stories, stories from scripture, some testimonies, and then I'll just, I'll just say, all right, well, now we're going to pray. I want you to put your hand where you need God to heal you. Now, locate that area of your body where you need a miracle in your life, and as I pray, you just receive healing from God. And then I'll pray for a few minutes, take authority over certain things. And then, then what I'll tell them to do is, all right, now I want you to do something you couldn't do before. I want you to act your faith. And so you'll, you'll see these people out there waving their crutches in the air or bending over or checking their eyes. When what they're doing is they're putting faith to or action to their faith. Because James says, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. 
So that's one of the principles we've got we've to see is that there has to be action. You can say, hey, I'm healed. But till you actually lay down those crutches or take off that knee brace and start walking, you really don't believe you're healed until you start doing something that you don't think you could have done before. Amen? Amen. So healing through the word. And there's a great example in, in Luke chapter 5, which I'm not going to look at. But it says that as Jesus taught the people, the power of the Lord was there to heal them. When I look at that, I see that as I'm speaking or as you're speaking the truth to someone, the power of God is in those words to bring healing. I don't got to go lay hands on them necessarily. Now I do that, but what's even better is to lead a person to a place of faith where they're able to receive healing for themselves. Is this making sense to anyone here? Is this, you guys tracking with me? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a few things. Um, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 to 22. And what I really want to do is help, help us all become established in what the Word of God says. Now, we all believe God, he, God heals. We all believe it's God's will to heal us. But why? Why is that? Because a pastor said it or because we've actually seen it in the Word for ourselves? So Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, 21 and 22. This is amazing right here. It says, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Now, what's he saying here? What's he saying? How are we supposed to approach the word of God? It says where to give attention. Now, that literally means to bend your ear to someone or something. And it says, incline your ear. Do not let my words out of your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. So as I look at that, those are all meditative terms. What the writer of Proverbs is saying is that we need to take the word of God and we need to meditate it on it. We need to keep it before our eyes. We need to think about it, ponder it, and look at it until it becomes a reality for us. And then verse 22, it says, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. That's a healing scripture right there. When we think upon, meditate on, look at the word of God until it becomes a reality, it will become life to those who find it and health to all their flesh. How many guys need health in all your flesh? Right there, it gives you the prescription to walking out health and healing on a daily basis. And where is it? It's in the Word of God. Pretty simple, isn't it? The faith of a person. Now, I was talking with Jim Richards a couple years ago, and I, I recently did a, uh, a Bible school class on healing in his Bible school. And so this, this, first, this lesson that I'm teaching today is kind of adapted from the first two lessons that I did. But one of the conversations with Jim that I had, we were talking about individual faith and the necessity of healing to have an individual faith. And if you look at all Jesus' healing miracles, um, and I've heard Jim say this before, and I actually wanted to check up on it and make sure if it was, if it was correct. <laughs> but he said there was 21 individual healings in the Gospels. How many of you guys have read through the four Gospels? Now, if you actually go through it, a lot of the times they're repeated in numerous Gospels, like Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a lot of the same material. But there's only 21 individual healing testimonies in those four Gospels. It seems like there's a lot more, but there's 21. And out of those 21, 19 of those present, or excuse me, 14 of the 21 specifically say something about faith. So the faith of the person or the faith of the people that brought the person to Jesus was directly connected to the healing. Is this making sense? So 14 out of 21 of those examples show that faith was absolutely essential. Now, 19 out of 21 of those examples, it's, it implies some sort of action. The sick people took some sort of an action. They got up from their mat. They went. Jesus said, you know, go show yourself to the, to the, to the, the priest, and they went. So there was some sort of action. So what, what's the point there? The point is that faith and healing and faith and action are absolutely connected. 
We need to trust that what God is, has said, he will do. Amen? So I wanna, I'm going to spend the rest of this time, and I want to lay out, um, I want to give you guys some basic facts for having a biblical basis for health and healing, things that will help us believe that healing is all for all and healing is for today. Sound good? All right. Am I going too fast for people? All right. Fact number one, there was no sickness in the garden. Duh, right? But how many of you guys know that the Garden of Eden, it gives us a blueprint for what God wants to do in our lives? And there's someone listening to me online. So the Garden of Eden paints a picture of what God wants to do in our lives. And how many of you guys know there was no sickness, there was no death, and there was no sin in the Garden? And there's really only three places in the Bible that show us exactly what the will of God looks like on earth in flesh and blood. You guys know where those three places are? Number one, the Garden of Eden. It shows us exactly the way, the way things should be. If everything was right on planet earth, what would it look like? Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve lived in a perfect relationship with God. They had all their needs met. There was no sickness. There was no shame. There was no death. There was perfect provision. So if we want to look and say, this is the will of God. We can look back and say, the Garden of Eden shows us what that's like. That's number one. Number two is when Jesus Christ walked and talked on this earth and what he did through his ministry. Now, he came into a world that was full of brokenness, but Jesus perfectly resembled the Father God. Therefore, if Jesus didn't do it, it's not God's will and desire for us, right? He didn't permit it. You know, a leper came to Jesus and he said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And what did Jesus do? He said, I am willing to be cleansed. He showed us the will. So number two, if you want to see the will of God, number one is the Garden of Eden. Number two is Jesus Christ, what he did. And then number three is going to be the millennium when Jesus Christ is actually ruling and reigning on this earth. Those three places give us an example of what the will of God looks like. So fact number one, if we're going to approach sickness from a biblical standpoint, number one, we got to understand there was no sickness in the garden, and therefore sickness is not the will of God. Fact number two, we can believe that healing is for us, for today, and for all, because the Bible shows in both the Old and New Testaments that God is the healer. Like I said at the beginning, when I first got interested in this topic of physical healing, I went through every instance in the Bible, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and I found that God is the healer. Now, there's some verses in there that might bring doubt from time to time, where it appears that God inflicted someone with sickness or did this or that, but as a whole, if you take the word of God, you're going to come across, you're going to come out with the perspective that God's will is always to heal. Amen? Some of you guys are looking at me like, what is he saying? Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, it says, I am the Lord, I change not. I love that. That word change is the Hebrew word shana, and it means to duplicate, to alter, to have a double, to disguise, or to do a second time. God is not, he doesn't have a double side. He doesn't duplicate. He doesn't alter himself or disguise himself. He doesn't hide behind a cloak where sometimes he's doing good and sometimes he's doing bad. He is the same. He didn't change from the old to the new. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? He didn't change from the old covenant. He wasn't the grumpy creator in the old covenant and the God and father of Jesus Christ in the new covenant. He is the same. The covenant changed, but he never changed. So fact number two is the Bible shows in both the old and the new testaments that God is the healer. Amen. Fact three, healing is part of God's covenant name and nature. Exodus 15 verse 26. You can pull that up, Gabriel. Exodus 15, verse 26. Well, I've got the verse here. I'll go ahead and read it. Jehovah Rapha. How many of you have ever heard that terminology? Jehovah Rapha. Now, 
There's multiple places in scripture where you have the names for God. You have things like Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Uh, Jehovah Tiskanu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our victory. And what these names do is they show us who God is. He will never be something that his names show him to be. You know, for example, he's not the Lord who makes you sick if his name is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord your healer. So his names, they, they show us the way he is, what he does and how he wants to be in our lives. And he'll never violate those names because that would be violating who he is. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? If he's Jehovah, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace, if something comes into our life and it brings torment and confusion, you know what we can know? It doesn't come from the Lord. If he's our provider, the Lord, our provider, if something comes in to steal our provision, you know what? We can know that doesn't come from God because he's our provider. He'll always be, his name show who he is. And so Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, it says, if you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So the context of those verses, that's when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. He brought them across the Red Sea, and he makes a covenant with them, and he says, I am the Lord who heals you, and I will not bring on any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. Some people read those verses and they think, well, look, God brought the diseases on the children of, on the Egyptians. How many of you guys have read that before? You know, Hoochie and I were just reading that the other day, and, and she's like, what? <laughs> Take two, what? What's it saying? Now, if you actually dig into those verses, and I've heard several people do this, and I've, I've followed up as well, it's not saying that God brought it on the children of Israel. It's more of a passive sense uh, where they, these diseases were permitted to go on the, on the children of the Egyptians because of their decisions. There's a big difference between something happening and, and God actually causing something to happen. Does that make sense? God did not cause sickness to come on the children or the, the Egyptians. But the point is, he says, I am the Lord who heals you. So God made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt that he was going to be known as their healer. That was under the old covenant. That was under the old covenant that was made with goats, the blood of goats and bulls. It was an inferior covenant. But check out Psalms 105, verse 37. So God made a covenant with the children of Israel, and it says that he brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among his tribes. That's talking about when he brought them out of Egypt. Now, that word feeble means sick. So they believed that God was Jehovah Rapha, their healer. A whole nation believed that he would be their healer. And the whole nation came out of Egypt, and it says that there was not even one sick person among them. Isn't that wild? Let that sit in for a second. A whole nation, and we're talking several million people, anywhere from one to four million people is what they put it at. A whole nation believed a promise that God would be Jehovah Rapha, their healer, they believed the promise, and not one of them got sick coming out of Egypt in the desert. That's mind-blowing. Now, we have a much better covenant, don't we? So if three million people could trust God to be their healer under a covenant that was really based off of their ability to obey that covenant, shouldn't it be easier for us to walk in health and healing? because it's been purchased through the blood of Jesus Christ. Man, these are facts that if you allow some of this truth and, and some of these things you might have to go back and think about and meditate on, but if you can let these things actually become a part of who you are and what you believe, healing should become easy. You should be able to walk it out, not becoming preoccupied with, do I have enough faith? But you put the word of God in, you let it do its, its part, its work in you, and pretty soon you're just going to realize, hey, I'm healed. Like, like some of these testimonies I'm showing. 
earlier. These people, God just touched them where they were at, and they, and they, walked, they walked out completely healed. So fact number three is healing is part of God's covenant name. It's his nature. He'll never be contrary to what his name shows him to be. He'll never be Jehovah, the one that makes you sick, if his name is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, your healer. So these are facts that we can build our life on. Fact number four is sickness does not come from God. Does not come from God, period. Now, if you can get, get, get your hands around this, you know, get your heart around this, that it's never God's will. You know, some, there are natural consequences to living on planet Earth. If you, if you eat terrible and don't exercise, there might be consequences, but it doesn't come from God. You know, even in Romans chapter one, it talks about those that, that uh, and it implies living in homosexual relationships, it's talking about the Romans, that they actually receive a punishment in their body. How many of you guys know if you go outside the will of God on things, there might be consequences in your bodies, but it's not God. It's sowing and reaping. It's the consequences of sin. If you drink hard liquor your whole life and your liver fails you, don't go blame God, right? So I'm not saying that there's not consequences for certain things, but sickness never comes from God. There's natural things that happens, and then there are, there are spiritual things that happen. I can't tell you, you know, Dennis was sharing last week about all the, the demonic manifestations that we see in, in a lot of these crusades. And part of the reason is, is because the areas we go are just full of witchcraft, and you've got witch doctors, and people go to the witch doctors, and so they open themselves up to demonic spirits. And half the time, you'll have someone come forward who needs to be physically healed, and they'll end up getting delivered of demons, and then the healing will manifest. I can't tell you how many times. I remember we were in a village in Zambia, and man, this was probably 11 years ago. And in this little outreach we did in a little village community, we saw six totally deaf children get their perfect hearing back. Now, that wasn't just natural. It wasn't something natural. These kids weren't all just going deaf because of something natural. There was some demonic activity going on. Now, I don't make a lot out of about the, uh, you know, the demonic realm, but it's there. But what I want us to see is sickness does not fr come from God. There, are, there is natural sickness, but there also, Jesus actually, he time and time again would cast a spirit out of a person, and then that person would be healed. I'll give you guys a couple examples, all right? Kim's looking at me like, what are you talking about? No, I'm just, no, I know, <laughs> I know, you're tracking with me. So let's look at Luke chapter 13. And like I said, some of the stuff you're gonna have to go through and just, just think about, but as I was praying, I just wanna give us some biblical framework to trust God for healing every time whether it's for us or whether it's people we're ministering to. Because even if you come and, and people imply that you know, God is the healer, but you don't have, if you haven't worked through some of these things in your own heart, then you're not going to be immovable. And God wants us to be immovable in the word. So in Luke chapter 13, right around uh, verse 12, it says, or excuse me, verse 10, it's, he was teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. So what was this? This was a spirit that was causing her to be sick for 18 years. So it was, it, this was a demonic, um, demonic afflicted sickness, and she was bent over and could no way raise herself up. When Jesus called her, to him, he said, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid hands on her and immediately she was made straight and she glorified God. Thomas, we've seen this a few times, haven't we? You take authority over something demonic and they're immediately healed. But then they begin to criticize her. The ruler of the synagogues, um, he gets upset with Jesus and the people and he says, there's six days, come and get healed on one of those days, don't come on the Sabbath. Did you guys hate religion? And the Lord answers and he says, hypocrites, does not each one of you on the Sabbath lose his donkey or ox from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan has bound, think of it, 
for 18 years be loosed from his bond on the Sabbath. So who did Jesus say was afflicting this woman? Satan. It was demonic. So erase from your mind any idea that God somehow gives, permits, or allows sickness for some unknown purpose of his. That's not the way your heavenly father is. Now, I'm not saying that every sickness is a demon. Don't get me wrong, but they do not come from God. And there are, they are, there is demonically afflicted sicknesses. Right here, Jesus said that this was a spirit of infirmity. He delivered this woman. He set her free. She didn't have to manifest, did she? She doesn't even say she would manifest. And she just got set free like that. She ended up following Jesus. Luke, or uh, Acts 10, verse 38, here's another one. It says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So what was he doing? Healing, doing good, and healing all. There's that all part. God once desires and has provided healing for all because God was with him. And it was all that were oppressed of the devil. So where does sickness come from? The devil. <laughs> it doesn't come from God. Fact number five, and I think we'll do one or two more, and then we're going to have a time of communion. And I believe that you can be healed during this time of communion. Amen? Fact number five, and I'm going kind of, kind of quick through some of these. The life and ministry of Jesus give us the clearest picture concerning God's will and desire to heal all. Let that sit in. Let me read it again. The life and the ministry of Jesus gave us the clearest picture concerning God's will and desire to heal all. Did Jesus ever put a sickness on a person? Did he ever say that, hey, you know, I'm going to afflict you, but it's really for your own good? <laughs> This is my love in disguise. Or you've been a bad person. Let me afflict you with a little bit of sickness there. You didn't pay your tithes. Here's some cancer for you. It's not the way God rolls. Smile, Bryce. Jesus showed us what the heart of the Father, what he wants to do. And there's, there's a bunch of scriptures there, which you can take a picture if you want, but I'm not going to read them all. But... Over and over again in the book of Matthew, it says Jesus healed all. Crowds of people came to him, and he healed all. Now, Jesus didn't heal every person in Israel, did he? But it says that everyone that could get to Jesus, for Jesus, that was enough faith. If you could get to Jesus, you could be healed. Like, their faith, their action, that was a sign of faith. Everyone that touched him was made perfectly well. There's all these scriptures over and over again. He healed all. And like I referenced, the only time there was someone with a question was a leper in Matthew chapter 8. And you remember what, what he, he came to Jesus and he said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me well. So he knew that Jesus could. He just wasn't sure if Jesus would, right? He knew that God had the power, and if you're a Christian, you know that God has the power to heal. But most of the time, people just don't, they, they, they question whether it's the Father's will to heal every time. He's I got the power, but not necessarily the willingness. And what did Jesus do? This leper, this outcast, this man with the skin disease, Jesus put his hand right on the man, right on that infection, right on that leprosy. Anyone here ever seen someone with leprosy? I have. It's, it's pretty gnarly. Jesus put his hand right on the man, and what did he say? He said, I am willing. I am willing. Not only do I have the power as the Son of God, but I have the willingness and desire be cleansed. And it says that Jesus was moved with compassion. So there's another key. He did it because he was moved with compassion. Now think about this. In John 6, 38, Jesus said, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. So if Jesus said, I've come to do only the will of my father, what was the will of the father in the case with the leper? To heal him. If Jesus and the father willed to heal one person, he wills to heal all people. 
It's not pick and choose. He doesn't have favoritism. He doesn't show favoritism. What he did, he did for all that would come to him, that would receive it. So Jesus, what he showed by his life, he showed us that God is good and willing and desires to heal us every time. You know, you, we, we, we don't have any, none of us have difficulty believing that God wants to save someone every time, do we? Why? Because the Bible says God's not willing that any would perish, but all would come to repentance. But then we ignore the example that Jesus gave that it's also God's desire to heal every time. Why? Because this last fact is when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he not only provided for us to be forgiven, but to be healed. The same place that he took upon himself, and the Bible uses the word, the word bore, Isaiah 53, to bear something means to carry. Something that's not yours is put on, on you and you carry it. It says he bore our sin on the cross, and it also says that he bore our sickness on the cross. The same place Jesus Christ provided not only for our sins to be forgiven, but our sickness to be healed. If he did it on the cross, if he took it on the cross, that means it's for everybody. Regardless of your background, regardless of your denominations or your religious teaching. So fact number five, and this is, this is the... Man, this, this right here is the foundation. The atonement of Jesus, or what Jesus accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection, includes both forgiveness of sins and healing for the body, period. There was a lot more to it, but that's what he provided. And so what, for us, what that means is that we can go to God with absolute assurance that it is his will to heal every single time because the reality is he already healed us. He already provided forgiveness. He already provided peace. He already provided healing. And this is what Isaiah 53, 5 says in the Amplified. Just listen to this. It says, he himself took in order to carry away our weakness and our infirmities, and he bore away our sickness. And with the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. Pretty awesome. And if he did it for one person, it's for you. He bore it away. Why? So you don't have to. He took it. Why? So you don't have to keep taking this. He provided healing, not only spiritual healing. Sometimes people will say, well, that's spiritual healing. No, actually, if you look Matthew 8, 17, Matthew quotes it in reference to Jesus healing all the sick people. So if Jesus took it, we don't have to take it. We don't have to carry it any longer. Man, that's good news, isn't it? Jesus referenced, and I'll wrap things up with this. How many of you guys remember the serpent in the wilderness? And uh, I believe it's Numbers, maybe around chapter 13. And as a consequence for the sin, these snakes went among the people, Israelites in the desert, and they bit the people and and they started to get sick and die, and Moses cried out to, to, to God, and God said, well, make a, uh, make a bronze serpent on a pole and hold it up, and everyone who's been bitten and is sick and dying, if they look to that serpent, they'll be made well. And uh, Jesus referenced that in John chapter 3. He said, in the same way that Moses lifted up that pole in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who looks to him or believes may have everlasting life. So when Jesus, that's another reference that Jesus saying, you're going to have everlasting life if you look to me as I hang on that cross. Now, Israel, they experienced physical healing when they looked to that serpent on a tree. When we look to Jesus Christ, who became our sin, that's the whole thing of a serpent brought sin into the world, right? Jesus became our sin and took the judgment for our sin. And if we look to him, we can be not only forgiven and given everlasting life, but we can be made whole. We can be physically healed and set free. What's the criteria? Look to Jesus. Don't look to yourself. To, and it goes without saying, if you're looking to someone, you're no longer looking at yourself. 
You're no longer looking at your imperfections. You're no longer looking at your ability to obey God or, or your checklist of, of dead works. God, have I done this, this, and this? If you look to Jesus, you're taking your eyes off of yourself and you're looking to him and what he accomplished for you. And that includes healing, healing for the body. Amen? So we're going to go ahead and we're gonna, I want to ask that maybe who, who's, who's going to do the communion today? Has anyone been asked? Well, I'm going to go ahead and ask Shane and Mercedes and one other couple. Andrea, why don't, why don't we get you guys?